Welcome back, CAD from scratch, episode 17. The topic today is 2D delaney triangulations with edge constraints. Before we get into that though, I want to quickly address some of the new viewers. A couple of my other videos went viral for the past few days and my sub count basically quadrupled. Um, so basically this series is my pet project where we're implementing CAD routines from scratch in C. CAD stands for Computer Aided Design. It's basically a, a tool that engineers and designers will use to make geometries for analysis, for simulation, or for uh, manufacturing, or like maybe 3D printing or water jet cutting or whatever. And in these videos, I'm basically implementing a CAD program piece by piece, talking about the process. Um, the only caveat being that everything in this series is done entirely from scratch. So there's no dependencies, there's no libraries, stuff like that. So if you run X11 on Linux, take, take the code off GitHub and compile it, it'll work no problem right out of the box. And all the code is ex explicitly public domain, so that's no problem. And right now we're in the beginning phases still. We can import models, export models, do some simple operations on models. Um, we can query things, we can change the view in different ways. Uh, we can pan the model around. So simple stuff is working. We have a lot of work to do though. I spent the past few videos um, working on like a few functions behind the scenes and we, we'll do that more in the next few videos. Um, but in a few weeks, we should have most of the core functionality set up for this, this software. And so if you're like a Python bro and all you do is you spend six hours a day pip installing libraries and stuff, you're not gonna enjoy this series, I don't think. But if you like knowing how stuff works, then maybe give it a chance if it interests you. And one last thing, I always put a timestamp in the, in the description so you can just skip to see the final results. It may help you get a better idea of what's going on if you're a little bit confused in the beginning. Without any further ado, let's get into the actual content. So what is a constrained triangulation? Well, basically, let's say you had a point set, these white dots here. In the previous video, we talked about how to generate a delaney triangulation of that point set. That would be this yellow grid of triangles here. And one good thing about this triangulation is that all the elements follow this special condition I'll talk about that condition later, but basically it makes all the elements have a very nice aspect ratio and be, be almost equiangular, be almost equilateral triangles. And so that is very, very nice. Um, the thing is though, there are some cases where you want to impose a constraint on the triangulation. That is, you want this red line to actually be an edge of the triangulation. Now, sometimes that edge will already be part of the triangulation. It will already be a member of the, of the triangles here. When it's not though, you have to somehow cut through triangles and replace them in a way that this red line is now a suitable member of the triangulation. And that's what we're gonna talk about in this video. And to do that, we're gonna be kind of adapting some of the work done by Sloan in this paper titled, A Fast Algorithm for Generating Constrained Delaney Triangulations. Um, which is a very good paper. Take a look at it. It's it's available online. You can access it no problem. And I put it upside down here, you know, in solidarity with the plight of the Australian people, because that's where this guy is from. So, power to the people, man. Good luck. So, why would you want to implement this? Well, I can think of a couple reasons why you might want to do this. Some real world examples and some mathematical ones that we're going to implement, for, you know, in this video. But the first one would be contouring through a defined feature. Let's say you went on a hike and you carried your phone around and you recorded the GPS coordinates and the altitude of a couple parts of your hike, like on a mountain or in a valley or in a flower field or whatever, and you had these data points here, these white dots. And you went home and you made a, a contour map of you know your journey using this method for triangulation. And that gives it you now that's very, very good for that purpose. I mean that's one of the reasons why people use this kind of triangulation, is because it makes a very nice contour map. Where you don't have very slim you know triangles so it's very good for that purpose however let's say there was a river here along this red line and you know for a fact that, that river is at sea level well you know some of these triangles edges may not be passing through zero in your contour map unless you were to you know impose that this red line be a triangle edge at sea level and that would fulfill that purpose right so that's one reason why you would want to, you know, use this method of triangulation. 
Number two, what about path planning? So let's say you were, I don't know, the Mars rover, and you were roving around Mars, taking soil samples at these white points. And you also had to very quickly measure some kind of wind data along this red line in the same journey, right? And so normally you'd make a triangulation to figure out your, your path planning route. However, you also want this red line to be part of your route because you have to take measurements along that line. And so you can use this methodology to force the red line to be part of your path, right? And the very last thing is what we're gonna do in this video, and that is slicing a mesh. So when you talk about you know, constructive solid geometries, you basically have bodies overlapping other bodies. And locations where they, where they intersect, those will eventually be constraints on our triangulations that we will have to implement in the next couple of videos. So I'll talk about that later, but know that this is done for a reason. So what is the algorithm to do so? So the first step of the algorithm is just to triangulate normally, to do what we did in episode 16 and just form this yellow grid of triangles from these white uh, point clouds, right? Once you've done that, we can loop over every constraint edge, so every one of those red edges. If the edge is not already part of the triangulation, you know, like for example, this one is not part of the triangulation, if not, record all the edges that it, that it intersects through. So for example, this red edge slices through one, two, three other edges of the triangulation. So you have to record those in this sort of list here. Then for every one of the intersections, we do a couple things. First, if the triangles that share that edge, because remember, every edge inside of this triangulation shares you know, two triangles, so if those triangles make a convex quadrilateral, we will swap their diagonal. I'll talk about more about what that means in a minute, but just know that for now, we're gonna swap the diagonals of convex quadrilaterals. Otherwise, we skip and go back to you know step two. Now, if that new diagonal that we just swapped still intersects the constraint, we're gonna add that to a list of, of we're gonna add it to the same list of edge intersections. Otherwise, if it doesn't cross the red line, for example, this orange line here is a new um, is, a, is a new edge, right? If it does not cross the red line, we're going to add that to a list of new edges. And for all those new edges, we're going to loop over them until nothing changes in the triangulation. And we're going to check if the edge is not a constraint and it still violates the Delaney condition, swap the diagonal. That's very complicated words, uh, you know, I don't expect you to get what that means, <laughs> but we'll go through it piece by piece and, and talk about how it, how it operates. So what is this the Delaney condition on the right here? Well, we talked about this in a previous video, but basically, let's see you had triangles with the points V1, V2, and V3. If you draw a circle through the points of that triangle, you know, the circumcircle, if that circle contains point P, for example, then that triangle is violated by point P in this condition, right? You know, as well, you know, triangle V1, V2, and P, the circle through those points, right, this circle here, also includes V3. And so in the same way, V3 violates V1, P, V2. So both these are, you know, are bad, failing, you know, the, this condition. So the solution to this is actually to swap the diagonal V1, V2 with diagonal P to V3. So you can see here how that would look. Basically, if you draw this as the new diagonal from those two triangles, um, the triangle through V1, V3, P does not have a circle that includes point V2 or you know, vice versa, P, V3, V2. That circle does not include V1. So this is the sort of the good swap. This is the, the bad swap. So in the previous video, we talked about how we can evaluate this condition, um, and there's some math to do so. You can take a look at this. It's pretty simple. Basically, you evaluate you know, pieces of it as you go and check if things are true or not um, as you go, and then if they're true or not, you can kind of stop the computation early, um, and that's kind of the, the benefit of using this methodology for evaluating the condition, but take a look at that and, and see if it makes sense. Now. In terms of swapping the diagonals, what does that actually entail? So let's say you had two triangles, triangle L and triangle R, 
shown here. If these two triangles require a swap, which these ones will require a swap, you have to do a few things. Obviously, you have to change which vertices are corresponding to which triangles, right? So on the left here, triangle L is P, V2, V1. But on the right here, it's P, V2, V3. So you can see that the third vertex there changed identity. But also, you have to keep track of the adjacencies. So, you know, keeping track of the adjacencies as you go through this methodology allows you to save a lot of time. Because if you can know what triangles touch other triangles, you don't have to constantly search the entire face for the triangle that you need. You can just check, oh, what's the triangle next door? And that makes this algorithm much more you know, efficient when you implement it. And so you have to keep track of the adjacencies. You have to update them as you go and swap diagonals. You have to, again, swap out what triangles are touching which other triangles. That's very important. Keep that in mind. If you implement this and you have any problems, the problems are going to be most likely because you messed this part up. <laughs> Always make sure you keep track of these triangles and their adjacencies very, very accurately. That's where your bugs are going to be when you implement this. Lastly here, to find the intersections between the constraint edge and your triangulation, it's actually pretty easy. So let's go up to the top again. You can see here, here was our, our constraint edge, and we've cut through one, two, three um, edges of the existing triangulation. And so the objective now is to figure out which edges we're cutting through. So the first thing you do is you start at a triangle which contains V1. V1 is one of the vertices of your constraint edge. Now find the triangle that contains V1 because there might be a few, right? There could be, you know, a triangle here, could be a triangle here, could be a triangle here. Find the triangle that has V1 that opens towards V2. I'll talk about that in a second, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to use this um, helper function here, which determines what direction is a point from a line segment. Anyway, um, back to this. Find the triangle that opens from V1 to V2. That's this triangle here. Then go around the edges of the V1 triangle. Remember, we're, we count triangles in uh, counterclockwise order. So the edges will go like this. So this is edge 1. This is edge 2. This is edge 3. Basically, go around and find which edge for which V2 is to the right. So we're not to the right of edge one. We are to the right of edge two. We're not to the right of edge three, right? As you're going around this, this triangle. Again, that uses this helper function here, helper function one, what direction is a point from a line segment. So we'll use that a couple times in this algorithm. Then go to this triangle. And this triangle, again, is stored in the adjacency array of this triangle. So it's very easy to determine what triangle is in this direction just by keeping track of what triangles are next to other triangles in general. And you're going to repeat that over and over and over and over again until you get to a triangle that includes V2. And once you're there, you're done. You found all the intersections between um, constraint edge and the given triangulation. So <clears throat> that's the process for that. Now, let's talk about the helper functions that we're going to have to implement to make this work. So as I mentioned before, the first one determines uh, what direction is a point from a line segment. So in this case, let's say you had line segment AB and a point of interest point P. It's very easy to get the cross product of AB and AP. If that's below zero, you're to the right. If that's above zero, you're to the left. Very simple. Function number two, do two line segments intersect? We implemented, we implemented this, in, I think, two videos ago for the triangles you know, stuff. Basically, though, if you can satisfy this condition, Basically, that requires that your trying that your line segments intersect. And the way this works basically is you're checking if the um, if sort of this cross product and this cross product are in different directions. At the same time, you're checking if this cross product and this cross product are different directions. If they are, you know, check marks, check marks then the two line segments do intersect. If they're in the same direction, you know, then uh, there's no intersection that's possible. It's a very simple algorithm to check, though. 
And lastly, helper function number three is a given quadrilateral convex. So this is also simple to, to check. Basically, you go around a quadrilateral, so in terms of the side lengths here in one direction, and you take the cross product of side i and side i plus one. If those two are all, the, sorry, if, if the cross product of side one and side two is the same as side two and side three and side three and side four and side four and side one, if they're all the same direction, then you are convex. If one of them is the other direction, then you're not convex. And you know, in that algorithm, you can just kind of iterate through until one of them is not the same sign anymore, then you just break out of the algorithm and say, nope, you're not convex. With that, we'll go into the actual code here. And all the code is, actually, first let me show you the, um, the main function. What? CD into a file, okay, smart. Um, basically, I have a couple test cases here. I have eight of them. And the way this works is I'm importing to, the, to this, um, I'm basically passing as a parameter a couple of things, a, a bunch of points, a point cloud, as well as a constraint edge and how many points are there in, in, the, in the point cloud, right? And so for this, for this case one, there's only one um, constraint edge. It passes through vertex four and six. Test case two has, you know, same point cloud, but different constraint edge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have some of these that have multiple edges for constraints just to check and see how they work. And I'll, I'll test these cases out at the very end of the video and you can see how that, how that works. So now in terms of the actual um, implementation of these, these, these algorithms here, the, the two test cases, or sorry, sorry the, the three helper functions um, are shown here. So the first one is point direction from line segment. This just implements exactly that cross product that I talked about before. Um, if a point is you know, to the right of AB, this function returns one. This function here returns one. So less than zero returns one. Next function here is another bool function, line segments cross 2D. This implements this helper function here. If, if either of these two are less than zero, we, or sorry, if they're both less than zero, we implement, we say, you know, return one. If not, we return zero. And the last function to help us out is this quadrilateral convex 2D. This returns one if the quadrilateral of P1, P2, P3, P4 is convex. Again, it just computes the, the cross product here um, of the sides of the quadrilateral and returns one if it's convex and zero if it's not. Down to the actual meat of the algorithm here. We had this function last time called Delaney triangulate. I've changed one thing, that is I've I we're now passing in a, a, a list of constraint edges, and this um, structure is defined in our jump.h header file here. Very simple, just a, a list of arrays. So you, it's, a, it's, it's a linked list of arrays. So you have the number of values in each member of that list and the actual array itself. So very simple. Um, and so the way this works is the, the first part of this function is from episode 16. So Everything from here on down is episode 16 stuff. Very, very uh, simple stuff. Once we get out of episode 16, you know, that, that's the episode that basically creates this triangulation here. We have a couple things to do. So the first thing here is we're looping through all of the constraint edges. So that's the first step of the algorithm here. You know, for each constraint edge. So we're looping through this, this outer while loop is looping through all those um, constraint edges. And we're checking um, to find the triangles that each vertex is contained in. Now this is useful because we want to determine um, sort of like what triangle contains V1. Oops. What triangle contains V1 and, uh, and v2, because that will kind of determine whether or not we're, you know, at the beginning or end of our intersections. So that's that's the point of this. So we're doing we're looping through that. Now we're looking through all those triangles that contain vertex one, looking for vertex two, or 
until we find an edge that crosses vertex one over vertex two. So again, that's the part of this. So we're looking for this, the, the first line that crosses this, uh, this V1, V2 constraint edge. That would be line two here. That's the point of this. And so we're using, again, this point direction from line segment to determine if uh, vertex two is to the left or to the right of both edges on vertex one on this given triangle that we're looking through. Now, if we end up finding the edge, so if miraculously this red line is in that edge, well, we're done, right? So if that happens, we do nothing. If the edge is not found in the vertex array, we will start looking through intersections in our triangle um, trajectory. So that would be basically, we're starting here and we're passing through every triangle, you know, one by one until we get to vertex two. And again, we're checking if vertex two is to the right of any of the edges in that triangle. So again, we're looping through, like I said here, edge one, V2 is not to the right of ed for edge, edge one. It is to the right of edge two. It's not to the right of edge three. So edge two would be the triangle that you'd, you'd kind of go along that direction for. That's that here. Um, now comes the question of uh, looping through edges that need to be removed and adding edges onto the triangulation. So we are in this part of the algorithm here. Um, yeah, this part of the algorithm here, step two. So basically, we're trying to find triangles that contain a given edge. That's the first step here. And we're trying to evaluate if uh, the quadrilateral is convex. That's quadrilateral convex 2D. We're passing in the points on the quadrilateral that contains two triangles. If they're convex, we swap the diagonal that's shown here. And again, we're keeping track of everything. So not just the vertices, but also the actual adjacencies of the triangles. And that's all of all of this that's doing here. All these lines here is keeping track of the triangles and their adjacencies. Now, if that new diagonal still intersects with the constraint edge, we're adding that to our list of intersections. That's what this does here. And if it doesn't, we add that to the new edge list. So that's uh, step 2B right here. Now, it also can happen that the quadrilateral is not convex. If that's the case, you know, we go back to this. If it's not convex, we're going back to step two for the next iteration of this, uh, this for loop. So that's all fine. Now down here, this is step three, I believe. So yes, for each new edge until nothing happens, until nothing changes in the triangulation, we repeat this. So I have this variable here, swaps. And while swaps is less, sorry, is greater than zero, we will continue this iteration and this process of triangulating and fixing the triangulation. So swaps equals zero. And at the end of this, we're going to increment swaps whenever a swap occurs. So the way this works is basically um, we loop over all the new edges in the triangulation. And if that new edge is not the constraint edge, we identify the vertices. First off, the vertices that are not. Um, let me show an example. So for example, uh, P and V3 are vertices that, that do not share the boundary of the two triangles. So these would be like the lone vertices of this quadrilateral. So we evaluate those and we can use those to kind of enumerate the different edges and points on the triangles. That's very useful. That's all that this does down here. And finally, we're evaluating, as it says in this um, step here, if it's not a constraint and it violates the landing condition, we swap that diagonal. So from V1 to V2 to P to V3. So we're evaluating the condition using that same math from the last video for the landing condition, the math being this math. So if we satisfy the condition, we are, um, we're fine. If it doesn't satisfy, that is if triangle zero has a vertex inside triangle one circumcircle or vice versa, we have to swap that diagonal, and that's what all this does down here. Again, it's not very difficult, just take a look, and we increment swaps. And at that point, now that you go back and loop through your um, new edge loop, you're basically done. So it's a very simple algorithm to kind of conceptually understand. I will say it's very challenging to implement, and it will take you a couple of days to make sure there's no bugs in, in the way this works. So 
I'm done with that. Uh, compile, and uh, it should run. And now we can pass in an input uh, test case number to, to, to pick a test case. I'll just show you how this looks. So um, pass in test case one or test case four or test case eight, different kinds of uh, results occur. Basically, it, um, this first block of uh, values here, this is the post triangulation pre-constraint for text list. So basically that just shows you um, this sort of result. That's from video uh, episode 16. The second set of um, indices here, these are the post-constraint vertices. So this this will give us this triangulation. And at the bottom here is the, the actual point cloud itself shows you which, which index, you know, zero, four, or seven, what that corresponds to for each triangle. So those, the points in space. And so for this, I have a, uh, a MATLAB or an Octave test file here with all of the point, the point cloud shown here and all the vertex lists here. Um, in MATLAB, you have to have, uh, for, for a, a polygon, you have to have the first, second, third, and then back to the first index when you, when you want to draw a complete loop of something. So that's why there's four indices here and not three. But long story short, I have a vertex list for test cases. Um, you know, this is the original solution. This is test case one, test case two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And then I'm just plotting the results. So I'll show you how this looks. We'll run it through octave test M. So here is the point cloud. That's what I'm passing into the the algorithm every single time. It's the same point cloud for every test case. Hit enter, this is the triangulation. And once we've finished with sort of episode 16's content, this is how the triangles look. It's a very nice triangulation. So it's, this is before any constraints are applied. Now, this is the first test case. So in this test case, I passed in a constraint edge that already exist, existed as part of the triangulation. Because of that, there's no difference between test case one and the pre-constraint triangulation because the this is the edge I think that I implemented here as a constraint edge. It already existed, so there's no work to be done. Test case number two, I added a constraint edge that crossed one existing edge. So you can see that this edge here was the constraint edge and it basically replaced this edge. It crossed through and it replaced that edge. So very simple there. It seems to work for test case number two. Test case number three is the same thing, but a different uh, constraint edge. So here, this blue line is the constraint edge that I implemented. And you can see it, it basically replaced these two triangles with these two triangles. So very simple. Test case four, a more extreme example of the constraint edge. So here, the edge in maroon here from this diagonal to this diagonal location, that's the constraint edge. And you can see how we've formed these triangles around uh, you know, that constraint edge. So that seems to work. Test case number five, another extreme example, perhaps even more extreme. This maroon line here is the constraint edge. And again, we've retriangulated around that. So everything seems to form a nice triangle. Test case number six, here I'm implement implementing two constraint edges. So this blue one and this maroon one, they are both, you know, not in the original triangulation, so we're both implementing those two edges, and they cross through, you know, here and here. That's no problem. It seems to work with two different edges. Test case number seven. This is one of the harder ones. I'm implementing um, this blue line here as a constraint edge, as well as this green line. So they're kind of touching at one location, and they're passing through different amounts of the body. And again, you can see it forms, you know, a very nice triangulation around those two constraints. And lastly, test case number eight. Um, passes, I think, from this point here to this point here to this point here. And so this is a combination of existing edges and intersecting edges. So again, it seems to work for this case as well. So for all those test cases, we seem to have a functioning triangulation um, with a constraint. And so I believe we've implemented everything that we need to do to have a constrained linear triangulation in 2D. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.